All right, so uh, chapter two, we're going to talk about frequency distributions and graphs. So let's just get some vocab down first. So um, data in its original form, we call that the raw data. And then a frequency distribution is the organization of raw data in table form. And we're going to use something that's called classes and frequencies. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, a class specifically is just a qualitative or quantitative category. And then the width of a class is just the number of data values that are contained in a specific class. So as we do some examples, you'll kind of see what we mean by all of that. So the first type of frequency distribution we're going to look at is a categorical one. So this is going to be used for data that can be placed in specific categories. So it's not going to be numerical stuff. Um, it'll be categorical. So the first example says that 25 army inductees were given a blood test to determine their blood type, and we want to construct a frequency distribution for the data, and then we're given what the data set is there. So a frequency distribution is basically just like a fancy name for um, a table that's going to organize all of your data nicely. Okay, so um, I kind of have a, a framework for us there with that table that's in the notes. So here's how we typically lay everything out. So for your first column, we're going to put all of the classes. The second column is the tally column. Third one is frequency. And then the last one um, is percent. So your classes are just going to be all of the categories from your data. So we're talking about um, blood types. So our possible options are A, B, O, and A, B. So just whatever categories are in your data, those are going to be your classes. And then tally, it's kind of a silly column, but it's how your textbook um, does this. It's basically just a place for you to keep track of like how many A's there are, how many B's there are, how many O's, et cetera. So this part's a little bit tedious. You got to go through all your data, count up how many A's. So I'll just tell you what they are. Um, you get five A's, seven B's, uh, nine O's and four AB. Okay, and then frequency is just where you're actually going to put what the tally number was. So for frequency, we'll say five, seven, nine, and four. Okay, and then um, one way that you can check whether or not you actually got all of the data values and you didn't skip any is to add up those total frequencies. So if you add 5, 7, 9, and 4, you do get 25, which was how many, um, how many army inductees uh, were determined their blood type. So we did catch all of them. So we didn't miss any, so that's good. And then the percent column is where we're going to state like what percent of the total had type A and whatnot. So for percent, um, the formula is the frequency for that class or category divided by N, which is going to be the total number in your sample, times 100. So N is 25 in this example, because there were 25 army inductees. So for class A, you would take the 5, which is the frequency for that class, divide it by 25, and then times it by 100. And when you do that, you get 20. So 20% 20 had type A blood. And then you're just going to do that for all of the classes. So for B, you would do 7 divided by 25 times 100. That comes out to be 28. And then I didn't show my work for the other ones. I think you can figure it out. Um, you would do nine divided by 25 times 100. That comes out to be 36. And then last one would be four divided by 25 times 100. And that comes out to be 16. Now, if we were to add up the percent column, what do you think that all of those percents should add up to? 100%. Uh, 100%, yep. Yeah. And sure enough, if you add 20, 28, 36, and 16, you do get 100%. So if it were, you know, very far off from 100, that would tell you that you probably did something wrong with your math over to the side there. And that's it. That's a um, categorical frequency distribution. Any questions on that? No, that was great. Cool. 
Okay, so before we get into um, the numerical ones, we're gonna look at a couple different ones. Um, the first one is called a grouped frequency distribution. So this is the type of distribution you're gonna use when your data is numerical and the range of the data is pretty large. So you wanna break it down into classes. So classes just means that you're gonna have like some sort of lower bound and upper bound. So when we talk about this stuff, we do wanna know like the names of everything. Um, so the lower class limit, when we say that, we're just referring to the smaller number in all of the classes. So examples of lower class limits using that table there would be like 58, 65, 72, et cetera. So it's just the smaller number in the class limit. And then upper class limit is just gonna be the larger number. So 64, 71, 78, 85, and so on. Okay, now just some properties about some of this stuff. So class boundaries, you'll notice that um, this range of numbers, there's no gap between them. So the upper class limit on this first row is 64.5. That's gonna match exactly the lower, um, oh, I should've, should have said class boundary. Upper class boundary is gonna match the lower class boundary on the next class. So there's no gap between those class boundaries. Um, class boundaries also have the property that they have one more decimal place than the class limits. So if your class limits are whole numbers, then the class boundaries are gonna have one decimal place. And to find class boundaries, if they're whole numbers, all you do is subtract or add um, 0.5 to either the lower or the upper class limit. And we're gonna do an example, uh, so we'll actually practice all of this. Um, but the class width, is found by doing the upper class boundary minus the lower class boundary. So it's just basically telling you, telling you how wide that class is. So um, you can use any class that you want to figure this out. Uh, if we just use the first row there, you would take 64.5 minus 57.5. That comes out to be seven. So it tells you that the class width is equal to seven. And you'll get the same answer regardless of whichever row you use. And then the class midpoint is just gonna be the middle number in all of those classes. So to calculate that, you just do the lower class boundary plus the upper class boundary and then divide it by two. So I'm just gonna do the first one. So you would do 57.5 uh, plus 64.5 and then divide that by two. That comes out to be 122 over two or 61. So does that seem reasonable to you that 61 is the middle number between 58 and 64? Mm -hmm. Yep, so that sounds right. So you could find your class midpoint um, for all of those classes. So can we just take the middle of the left-hand limits too, like the class limits? There's like 61's right between 58 and 64. To get the midpoint? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you can do either one. You can do the boundaries or the limits. And to get the class width, can you take the class limits and just add one? So you do 64 minus 58 plus one? Yes, but that's a lot harder for students to yeah, I just remember students asked me that, like, years Memorize ago. Memorize that, yeah. Yeah, because basically, like, you're counting how many numbers there are from 58 to 64. Mm -hmm. But if you just do 64 minus 58. You get six. You get six. When, if you count on your fingers, 58 through 64, there's actually seven numbers. Great. But you avoid that common mistake if you use the class boundaries. So if you do that one minus that one, you do just get seven. Right. Okay, so let's do an example. We're actually gonna build one of these tables. Um, oh, before we do that, some rules for constructing a frequency distribution. Um, these first few are not very strict rules. They're kind of just preferences. Um, there should be between five and 20 classes in your table. Anything more than that, your table is just not gonna be um, very readable. And then it's preferred that the class width be an odd number. Okay, so those are just preferences, really. The rules are three through six. So the classes must be mutually exclusive. So that just means that they can't overlap in any way. Um, the classes must be continuous. 
So there's no gaps allowed between the classes. So even if a class has a frequency of zero, you still have to include it in your table. Uh, Phi says that the classes must be exhaustive, which just means that it accommodates all the data. And then the classes must be equal in width, and that's gonna help um, avoid a distorted view of the data. So you always wanna keep those four things in mind when you're doing your table. Okay, and then I have the steps for you there in the notes for how you actually construct one of these. So we'll just follow those steps as we go throughout the first example. Okay, so example two says that um, the data represents the record high temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit for each of the 50 states. Construct a grouped frequency distribution for the data using seven classes. Okay, so the first step, I'm gonna read them from the notes. Um, step one says to find the highest and lowest values. So you're just gonna look through all of your data values jot down what the largest number is and what the smallest number is. So 134 is the largest number there. Um, can you find the smallest one? Are you looking for it? Uh-oh, I think I lost Dr. Insko. Okay, I'm just gonna keep going. So the smallest one is 100. That's the lowest number there. And um, the next piece of step one says to find the range. So the range is just gonna be the highest number minus the lowest number. So you'll do 134 minus 100, and that comes out to be 34. And then the next step says to select the number of classes desired. Now, if you're actually doing this you know, out in the real world, then it's up to you to select the number of classes that you wanna use. However, because we all wanna get the same, um, the same answer in a classroom setting, the question is always going to tell you how many classes to use. So you can see up here that it says to use seven classes. So that's gonna be um, the number of classes you'll use. And then it says to find the width by dividing the range by the number of classes and rounding up. So you would do the range divided by number of classes, so 34 divided by seven. And that comes out to 4.86. Okay, now this number, it says that you're always gonna round it up. Okay, so 4.86, that does kind of naturally round to five. However, even if it came out to like 4.1, you would still round that number up to five, okay? And the really tricky part is that even if it comes out to a whole number, like four, you still round up to the next whole number. So whether you got four, 4.1, 4.5, 4.9, all of those would round up to five, and that would be um, the class width. Okay, and then we're ready to kind of go to our table here. So it says select a starting point um, and then add the width to get the lower limits. Okay, so the starting point is gonna be the lowest number. So our lower limit on the first class will be 100. And then the way that I like to do it is you're gonna work vertically. So you're gonna add the class width and that's gonna um, give you all of your lower class limits. So 100 plus five is 105, add five again, you get 110, add five again, you get 115, 120, 125, and 130. Okay, and then now we wanna go do um, the upper class limits. So the way that I usually do it is I look like at this second number here. So if that's 105, then that means the number before it just needs to be, you know, one number before. So from 105, that means that one has to be 104. And then you can just keep going like that. So like 110, the number before is 109. Or the other way to do it is just to add five vertically down um, all of those upper class limits. Either way, you're gonna get the same values. So you'll get 114, 119, 124, 
129 and 134. And then for your class boundaries, I'm just going to move me here. Um, your class boundaries, you just basically want to um, subtract 0.5 from your lower class limit and then add 0.5 to your upper class limit. Oh, and something to point out, um, on this example, the largest upper class limit comes out to be 134, which just so happens to be the highest number in that data set. However, that does not normally happen, and that's totally okay if it doesn't happen. Typically, um, you'll get a number that's larger than the largest number, and that's okay, that's fine. Okay, so back to class boundaries. So you just wanna subtract 0.5 from your lower limit, so 100 minus 0.5 is 99.5, and then you're gonna add 0.5 to your upper limit. So 104 plus 0.5 is 104.5. And then you're just gonna do that for all of them. So you'll get um, 104.5 and 109.5, and then so on. So 109.5 to 114.5, 114.5 to 119.5, 119.5 to 124.5, 124.5 to 129.5, and 129.5 to 134.5. Okay, and then your tally column, again, this is, you know, kind of just for you to help keep track as you're um, going through all the data. So, you want to go through and find how many numbers are between these um, class boundaries. So from 99.5 to 104.5, you go look through all your data. I'll just tell you what that is. Um, you'll be able to find two numbers there. Um, between 104.5 and 109.5, you can find eight numbers and then so on. So. I normally hate filling out that tally column because for frequency, you're just gonna put the actual value there. So I'll just tell you what all the frequencies are. Um, you get two, eight, 18, 13, seven, one, and one. And that is your um, grouped frequency distribution. So it kind of seems like a lot of steps or a lot of work at first, but they're all relatively easy steps, so you just kind of have to practice it a few times, um, and then it's really no big deal. And if you want to check um, whether you, you know, missed any data values, you could just add up that frequency column, and it should come out to be uh, whatever the total number of data points was in your set. So we do have 50 there, which is good. <laughs>